generally we, Bekai goes back and forth between you know people but sometimes we have people from industry speak sometimes we have people from academia researchers speak and this is this talk is interesting because it's a about something which is a collaboration between the two. And I think too often people in universities, you know, um, I can say this because I was, I was at the university, stay kind of in the ivory tower and, you know, don't really mess around with what's going on in the wild web. And we're going to see something very different from that today. Uh, so we basically have a bunch of presentations from the Stanford class. What's the number of the class? CS377, which is about creating engaging Facebook apps. And there's a bunch of people presenting, and I won't try to introduce all of them. So I'll just introduce the two instructors of the class, and the class is a collaboration between the two. Uh, the first is BJ Fogg, and BJ has actually spoken at Bekai previously. Um, BJ leads research and design at Stanford's technology Persuasive Technology Lab, which he founded in 1998 to investigate how computing products can motivate and persuade people. Uh, he's a psychologist and author of a book entitled Persuasive Technology. And apart from this class, his other projects include creating a new theory of simplicity and designing a Stanford course about technologies that promote peace. So you can see BJ is ambitious in his you know, <laughs> technologies to create peace. Uh, the second instructor is Dave McClure. Um, and uh, Dave describes himself as geeking out in Silicon Valley for over 15 years as a software developer, a startup advisor, angel investor, blogger, and internet marketing nerd. And he does all these things. That's why his blog is called uh, Master of 500 Hats. Um, Dave is currently advisor for Mint Software, Spock Networks, Simply Hired, Teach Street, Crazy Egg, and okay. most recently my own company, SlideShare. Yes. Um, he's also conference chair for Graphing Social Patterns and co-chair of O'Reilly Web 2.0 Expo. And prior to this, Dave ran marketing for Simply Hired and its evil twin, Simply Fired. Um, with that, <laughs> over to uh, BJ and Dave, and we'll go on till the end, which is just about nine, at, at nine o'clock, and then we'll have about ten minutes for questions. Welcome. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. I know that time is a scarce commodity, and we want to make great use of your time. I hope you go home having learned a few things. I think I will. Um, even though we've scheduled our presentations kind of down to the minute and all the students have copies, I'm not sure what everybody's going to say. So uh, I think there'll be some surprises for me and I'll learn some things. I'm going to give a short introduction and what I'm trying to do here is show that what we're doing with Facebook or what I'm trying to accomplish in this class and beyond is um, a logical step from my previous work. So that's what I'm going to try to set up here. So, 1993, I came to Stanford University to study this question. How can you computerize persuasion? Um, PhD student, experimental psychologist, did a bunch of experiments and so on. In 97, I set up the Persuasive Technology Lab and conceptualized it as this overlap here. And we studied various modalities in persuasion, from websites to mobile phones to video games and so on. And I'll fast forward through a lot of things. In, uh, wrote a book about it. Uh, right now this book is kind of expensive on Amazon. I don't know why they cranked up the price and so did Barnes and Noble. Um, is it worth it? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, th I like the book to be honest but I can't believe the price right now on it. So um, get a used one or go look at it in the library or something. Um, we came out with a book this year called Mobile Persuasion. So we uh, started in 2001 started looking at mobile phones and persuasion, started focusing all our lab's work on mobile phones and persuasion. Oh, not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, in the fall of last year, I did a course that was all about Web 2.0 web and how those sites persuade. And what we found was all the successful Web 2.0 companies followed a similar pattern. And with some students, we mapped out this pattern with Dean Eccles. We put together a paper and we published it. And the pattern has three phases. Um, and we talk about it in the paper, what happens in each phase and so on. And so that was sort of like, well, that's really interesting, Web 2.0. We can move on and we can get back to mobile and peace tech and the other things we're doing. And then along came platform launch. So I also do a startup called Yak Pack, and we just happened to be part of the platform launch. We launched two apps on their, their launch in May, um, May of this year. And that was just a big eye-opener. First of all, 
you know, having the first meeting with Facebook and then going to launch and then seeing what happens when you're so close to the users where your engineers are just getting feedback almost not by the minute but within hours from users and they're responding rapidly and I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Then I got a lot more into Facebook and it's like, you know, this is a persuasive technology and BJ, even though some of your previous students did videos and projects on it, you need to get serious about looking at Facebook as a persuasive technology. And I do believe that Facebook is the number one persuasive technology of 2007. I would go so far as to say that there has been no persuasive technology more successful than Facebook ever in terms of persuading, changing attitudes and behaviors. Uh, when you look at the platform launch, uh, these are numbers from late October. You can see what ha was happening to Facebook platform launches. Uh, I don't know if it correlates with MySpace's drop, maybe, the line's right there. Compare it to eBay. So we think of eBay as big and having lots of users, but look what's happening to Facebook. So I think there's this kind of evidence that Facebook is achieving something in terms of persuasion. What I find most interesting in Facebook is what I call mass interpersonal persuasion. I'll get back to this in a minute. Now there's some evidence of this that we've all seen. Remember, remember the Burmese monks and the, the, um, the kind of rallying behind that? How many people have, have, have seen this before on Facebook, saw the Burmese monk group supporting them? How many people use Facebook? Okay, probably everybody here. So, you know, this, I, I took a screenshot of this to show how quickly this group grew to 1.2 million members. When could have that happened? 10 years ago or even five years ago, right? How many people have seen this one? <laughs> okay, so they, what took Barack Obama like eight or nine months to do, Stephen Colbert did in five days. So um, when you look at persuasion, this is one of the frameworks that we use in the lab. You have to have high motivation, high ability, and trigger. Facebook has done an amazing job of bringing all those things together at once. So mass interpersonal persuasion. This is the aspect of Facebook that fascinates me. For the first time, I think, in the history of the world, we now have a platform, Facebook and other social graphs. It's not just Facebook. The class wasn't just about Facebook. It was the fastest way to learn and get going with this kind of social graph and apps for social graphs. But for the first time in the history of the world, you have a way to take interpersonal persuasion dynamics that are incredibly powerful that you find in families and small groups and in classrooms and scale that up to millions of users. Eventually, I think billions of users and do that, as you'll see from some examples here, zero budget uh, without that much effort and you can reach millions of people and more very, very quickly. I think this changes the landscape pretty dramatically for people who want to do persuasive things in the world. One of our lab's goals is around peace technology. And one of the things that I want to take from what we've learned in this course is apply it. How do you use mass interpersonal persuasion to bring about more harmony in the world, to promote peace in the world? It's a very Northern California kind of thing to say, I think. Um, but I spent most of, uh, most of this morning talking to organizations about this that will likely help this really get rolling in a big way. I have to admit, what we did with Facebook in the last 10 weeks gave me a little bit more credibility with them, and next semester I'll be teaching a course in peace technology, as well as psychology of Facebook. But peace tech is something we'll roll out bigger, and it's really kind of one of the things in the lab that we've always wanted to do, but didn't quite know how to get our hands around. And now, now I think with some of the insights we got into mass interpersonal persuasion, we still don't know the answer, but I think we know how to move forward better. So that kind of gives you a glimpse into where I'm coming from, how this fits into my line of research and my interests. And Dave's going to talk about the class. Dave oh. Mubler, my co-teacher. So uh, Rob, uh, Rob Fan is one of our teaching assistants. And actually, you'll find out that really our teaching assistants did most of the work, and the students did the rest of the work. And BJ and I were along for the ride. Excuse me for just a second. Let me get rid of this. Could you hold that for a second? Thank you. Um, so uh, BJ has actually been teaching for a few years, but this was actually my first experience uh, as an official teacher at Stanford, uh, and I was definitely a rookie. I got my feet wet in a hurry. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about what the goals of the class are, and I'll get into this for just a second. Um, so I'm a real big believer in sort of applying uh, theory and practice, and one of the things that was great was I, I ran into BJ at uh, O'Reilly's Food Camp this summer, and we were talking about applying a metrics philosophy to product development and product marketing. 
And I asked him, I was like, hey, I'd be really interested in, in trying to come in and maybe do one class. And, uh, and that conversation kind of got rolling, and BJ sort of you know, hooked me in a little further. He was like, hey, why don't you eventually come in and, and co-teach this class with me? And then we started thinking about environments to teach uh, that philosophy, and the Facebook launch had already occurred, and it seemed like a great environment to try and do that. Um, so the original ideas were really for that class to build two apps, one that was around a distribution focus and one that was around a user engagement focus. Uh, and not really around monetization, although we actually uh, got into that a little bit with some of the uh, folks in the class. Uh, we wanted to learn about what social platforms and Facebook uh, were about, but really about how to do viral programming, uh, which we'll explain in a bit. And a lot of that is around iteration and fast failure. And so what we were trying to do was take a, a class of people. We really thought we'd get about 50, 40, 50 folks. We got over 100, <laughs> and that was original. That was uh, a bit of a challenge. So we had, we had teams of three, um, and uh, I guess by the time the class got started, we had about 90, and we finished with about 75. So we have 25 teams of three that have built apps. Uh, most teams have built at least one app. Some have built two. Several have built three, four, or five. Um, and that's actually been great. Uh, the most interesting thing, though, is that I think not everybody was successful right away, and then actually some people that failed were successful later. So although we're going to talk about some sort of home run successes, um, I actually think what's more interesting is people that didn't have success right away actually figured something out and were able to be successful, uh, at least on the distribution metric and to some extent on the user engagement metric as well. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, startup metrics for pirates. How many people have heard me give that talk before? I've heard about R. Okay, great. So uh, if you haven't heard this Michelle before. All right, so here's the model. There's five steps. Uh, acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and revenue. Acquisition is where users come from. Activation is the happy first visit they have, hopefully. Retention is they come back. Referral is they tell other people. And revenue is they make money. That all stands for A-A-R-R-R -R -R -R. Please turn to the friend next to you, do your best Captain Jack Sparrow impression, and join me in saying R. <laughs> all right, good. So that's a mnemonic to help you remember those five steps. And my basic uh, concept is that those five steps are what you should really be designing and thinking for when you're building a product, and then also what you should be thinking for when you're, when you're measuring effectiveness with, with marketing. And we wanted to take this model and try and apply it to Facebook, and it, it doesn't always fit perfectly. Um, I won't bore you with too much of this, but basically what I talk about is acquisition in a Facebook universe that comes from invites, discovery via the app directory, via feeds, via profile, uh, cross-marketing with apps, and then direct paid advertisement in some cases. Um, activation happens, at least in the Facebook environment, with that initial install of the app, but possibly also in the profile page via the uh, copy and graphics and the uh, CTA, which is a call to action. Uh, retention might happen via emails, via Kansas, Canvas page activity, other feeds and profiles. Referral, and the interesting thing is referral in the Facebook environment happens immediately. In other environments, typically it happens later once you actually get the users engaged with your site, but it actually happens immediately in a lot of cases when people install the app and then refer out to other people, and then it also happens later via feed and via other cross-marketing. Uh, and then revenue, which you know, a lot of that story hasn't been told as much in Facebook, and that may be one of the chief uh, areas that Facebook has a lot to do uh, work on. But actually, we saw some success in revenue monetization within our class uh, that was sort of uh, a lot more than we expected. Um, Okay, and I, I won't get into too much detail on this, but the basic concept is you can take those five stages, maybe break that into slightly more information, but that you then are looking at what's happening in each of those stages, the conversion percentages, potentially estimating a value for people at that level, and really designing for that, that concept. So the, the one thing I would like to leave people with is um, try not to design based on just your subjective feature assessment as to what the user is, is interested in, and don't put together business plans, and don't put together uh, spreadsheets on revenue projections. Just hypothesize a customer life cycle, wireframe and build to that hypothesis, and then test and measure around that hypothesis. And that was really the concept that we were trying to bring into the class is that you can still be creative in coming up with what you think the actual user actions are, are, are going to be that engage users and increase viral distribution and activation, but that you should measure against your guesses and then you should iterate quickly because your first guesses are probably going to be wrong. And that quick cycle of iteration, I'm not the first person to say this, will help you lead you to the path of discovery more quickly. Okay, so I won't bore you with any more of that particular presentation. And Rob, can I switch to the other presentation? All right, so uh, a little bit tongue-in-cheek here, but uh, one thing was the class had pretty tremendous success beyond our expectations. So uh, 
Just 10 weeks to Stanford World Domination, USC and Cal not included. It was a good year for Stanford in many ways. Um, so when BJ and I started this course, we thought, you know, what would be a sort of outsized performance if we were measuring based on the, the distribution uh, effort? And we thought people that achieve 10,000 users for their apps, that would actually be a pretty good performance, and we probably would give those types of students an A. Um, so what do we get? Total install users for the entire class to date is about 16 million. Uh, we have five apps with more than 1 million users, uh, 10 apps that are about at 100,000 users or more, 20 apps at 5,000 users or better. So actually, a majority of the class got 5,000 users or better, which was really pretty awesome. Uh, and about a third of the class really like blew us off the charts. Um, and that was, those are install numbers, so people installed the app, but actually even on the daily active use metric, uh, I think we've sort of advertised that we had a million daily active users collecting in the class. We've dropped a little bit away from that, so we're at about 900,000 right now. But again, six apps with about 100,000 daily actives, maybe 10 with 10,000 daily actives or more, and, and almost 20 apps with 500 daily actives. And I think actually, again, the, the, the lowest stat is the one that's most interesting, right? Getting 500 daily users on your application in just a month is actually not, uh, you know, not an insignificant accomplishment. Um, so all this kind of like blew us away and we started seeing this relatively quickly within the first month or so. We started, I believe, on September 19th. The first app that was out the door was maybe a few weeks later. Most of the class launched apps by November 1st and pretty much everybody by around November 9th. Um, so from November 1st through to about today, 16 million users, you know, or installs, I guess I should say. That's kind of unheard of. Now, I know other apps in, in Facebook had some of that success, but to duplicate that within our class was also pretty impressive. Uh, I think we have about top uh, five or six of the top 100 apps in Facebook measure, measured either by installs or by daily actives, or at least at one point. Um, and then according to Adonomics, which uh, our measurement for top 10 apps was at 10 million, and discounting for the Facebook insanity, we think maybe there might, you guys can't probably all see that, but uh, you know, Maybe, uh, maybe you might say that there's a million dollars of value created. I don't, I don't really know. At least five of the apps in the class we know were generating more than $1,000 a week in ad revenue, um, which isn't going to be you know, some massive startup company, but at least it was actually you know, paying uh, maybe for one student's tuition uh, in each of the teams, which is you know, not, again, insubstantial. Um, so I, again, I just want to emphasize that distribution was not the only focus. We, we were also trying to emphasize uh, a user engagement focus, and we'll talk a little bit about that later in the class. Um, but again, the distribution numbers sort of blew us away. Uh, and I think it is something that can be learned. I don't think this was just an exception because of Stanford students or because of this class. I think there are some interesting techniques that we picked up there. Uh, hopefully we can summarize some of those for you tonight. And if you'd like to come tomorrow night, we're also having the entire class present uh, tomorrow night, assuming we have room at the uh, Arriaga uh, Stanford Alumni Center. We'll have the whole class present. Okay, I'm going to pass off to other folks. Uh, yes, I think that was it. Great. So, Dan was our head TA and one of our, I guess, partners in crime deciding to do this thing. So, Dan's going to talk about, oh, you introduced yeah. yourself. Go for it. So, uh, I think the way I want to introduce this is basically to say that when you look at these numbers, it seems like we've been running an incubator for the past 10 weeks. That's the way I would look at this thing. But when, when you really bring it back down, this was a class at Stanford. Um, we may have touched 16 million people around the world. We may have a, a million people a day that we affect. But this is a class, and it was about learning. Um, so that's what this first section of the program is going to be about. It's going to be about the fact that we, in the course of 10 weeks, we were able to take these insights from Facebook and condense them down, distill them down, and actually teach them. And not to say that BJ, I, Dave, Rob, had any idea what we were doing coming into this thing. The students, for sure, uh, were the ones to distill this information and, and really teach it to us and teach it to each other. But the first section of this program is to look at the teams that didn't have success right out of the gate and learned in the next two, three, four weeks, iterated on what they had done, and pushed out apps that actually have immense success now. Um, so with that, the first team that's going to present is called Share the Love. And actually, ironically, their first app was called War. So, <laughs> here we go. Make love, not war. Hey, you're our whole thing. Hi, everyone. There's a lot of people here. Um, I'd like to first introduce you guys to the programming all stars that are Shawshank Singh Patty and uh, Shri Krishna Sharin. Give these guys a round of applause. 
So we're going to try to synthesize what we learned. And uh, I think the best way to synthesize that is to say, make love, not war. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, our first app was called Declare War. And we thought, what better thing to launch in Facebook than a game as simple as the card game that we've all played, War. We, uh, we did a slight variation of War in that we played with five cards. And uh, the best three out of five cards won the hand and therefore the match. Um, we built in a chat feature so that people would engage with each other because simply clicking a button, flipping a card, and knowing that you won wasn't that great. Um, however, war is not good, apparently. Uh, we launched it two months ago, and we've only got a uh, 1,000 installs uh, and 100 daily active users. Now, we ask ourselves why. Um, the, the conclusions that we came to are that the call to action, declare war, wasn't good. Um, users have a short attention span in that they would, they would play one hand, and since it was turn-based, they would log out and they would forget to log back in. We would also have very few chances to notify people in the newsfeed. And I feel like the newsfeed is a really valuable tool in driving traffic to your app. Um, so what do you do when uh, war fails? You make love. Uh, we created an app on a whim called Share the Love. And this app, in five days, got 100,000 installs. And to this date, has 750,000 plus users. And it's interesting to note that this app was launched in the very, very bare bones format, where you'd land on a Canvas page and you would invite your friends to share love. As simple as that. And we were able to achieve such success. Since then, we've uh, driven up user engagement around our community by building a wall where people can share thoughts of love. In addition to that, we've, uh, we've built a video, video vertical related to love where the, our social factory within our community can actually aggregate love related videos from YouTube and post them to the application. Um, and more functionality will be coming in the future. Our insights, keep it simple. Uh, launch with the bare bones and then build engagement into it as opposed to spending a lot of time building a fully functional game that no one uses. I know these guys would appreciate, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, secondly, appeal to motion and have, have a good call to action. Share the love apparently is a very good call to action. And, and finally, build a community around your app after you've actually uh, garnered a lot of users. Uh, share with you guys two screenshots. On, yeah, that's your, your left, you'll see the Canvas page you land on. You'll notice uh, the love meter shows you how many of your friends you share love with, in addition to how much your love circle is complete. This also shows up in your profile box, and it helps users understand what they're doing. And, and also, uh, and I guess it, it drives user engagement. On your right, you'll see the wall where people can share their thoughts. And quite a few people have shared their thoughts, 3,000 and some change to date. Thank you guys for your time. Very much. <laughs> oh, you're talking scary. Just to introduce these guys. Game uh, in their first try, and I think they do have some users in the game now. But they made two other apps after that, and maybe even more that I'm not aware of. And their, their second two apps, Good Luck on Your Exam and Bless You, are both also wildly successful. So hi, everyone. This is Team CXC. I'm Claudia Jimenez, the UI designer of the group. We have Chengyu Wang, our chief developer, and Xingxing Liu, our product manager. So what we're going to... Oh, thank you. <laughs> so we based our... We'll be talking about what we learned in how to create a viral application and the process it took to get there. So our first app was based on the childhood game of MASH. Won't go t into too much detail about it, but during the first week, it saw a very slow growth of users. And to this date, since its launch date, we only have a total of 1,000. So we wanted to look at 
exactly why this was. And looking at the flow of our app, it was definitely really complicated. Just looking at the picture, there's a lot of steps and there's a ton of buttons to click just to make it to the end. So we decided we'll use this, what we've learned, to create our second app called Bless You, which focuses on just one simple action, which is to send a bless. And there's only one simple click to do and you're done with the app. So now, looking this... <laughs> okay. <laughs> So there's a great improvement in the first week after launching this app. We have currently now 300,000 users compared to our 1,000. And Chengyu will tell you more about what Bless You involves. First, uh, I would like to tell you the story of Bless You. Uh, when we were brainstorming about application ideas, I got cold and sneezed. And Xinxin and Claudia said, Bless You at the same time. <laughs> Good idea, Bless You. <laughs> and by the night, I created the first variant of application, Bless You. <laughs> bless You is a simple and a common action in real life. It has large potential of uh, uh, users, and it is warmly wel uh, welcomed by religious users. Uh, besides simple, we have more, like the level system and the top list. We have lots of returning users, and here is a, ro a visitor royalty from the Google Analytics. Most people visit 15 to 20, uh, 25 times within the first 30 days. And Xinxin will go on to tell, tell you more about the further improvement. Yeah. Okay. So after we developed the application, uh, we start marketing uh, through the personal networks and uh, online advertisement and real-time user service. So that moved us from the original 10,000 active users per day to 15,000. But then it just stopped there. So what really works further is iteration. You can see we have interviewed a lot of experienced people uh, almost most of them are here, <laughs> and uh, we decided to focus on these three steps. Uh, first is user flow simplification, and second is the language polishing, and third about engagement enhancement. And that works a lot. So we moved from the original um, 15 active users to the 20,000 active users, and we finally reached a total user of uh, 320,000 today. Um, I can give you a little example about what we did during the iteration. It's our first page, I mean the very first one, it's very simple but not attractive. And then we made a really attractive one, but it became too distractive. And so finally we got one that's simple, it's attractive, and it's not distractive, and we are here. <laughs> okay, so right now um, we are working on Bless You for better engagement, and we also have the Good Luck You exam. Um, let's see how far we can go, and thank you. So this final team also made a game, um, and I think they're actually going to present on iterations they made on that game. Um, these actually were our first breakout success in the class. I think, what do you guys have, maybe 10,000 users or so? And everybody in the class went wild. 10,000 users in a week, oh my god, like, I can't even believe it. Right? Th that was the mindset that Dave said we were coming into this with. Um, but these guys iterated on the app, and I think they're going to have some interesting insights to share. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Brett Kynes, and this is Raul. Um, Andrew couldn't be here today, but we did start off early. We had a concept in place and just threw something out there probably a week or maybe two weeks before maybe any other you know, uh, team that was out there. And we started off really well, but very quickly we got passed by by a number of applications, including Kiss Me. They flew past us, got up to a million users by the time we were at 20,000, let's say. And so we thought you know, it was time for us to iterate around our virality. Um, and so that's what we did. So I'm, we're going to walk you through sort of the Canvas page and how we changed it and how we increased our virality and then later engagement um, by doing that. So th this was our original Canvas page. You'll see that the content that's outlined in the red is all sort of information, right? We throw a ton of information at you. And originally we thought that by giving you these, this information, for instance, how many throws you've had, how many hits you've had, how much money you had, we had a virtual currency in place, we would try to empower you to perform the action we wanted, which was to throw a ball. Um, but what we didn't know is that this was way too confusing and users wouldn't even get to where we wanted them to get to. We also had the events um, listed on the left-hand side, and this goes all the way down, as many throws as you've made or as many throws that have been thrown at you. 
but the real estate occupied by the things that we wanted you to do was very small. So a user had to click within these red boxes or click on add money in order to actually throw an item. And that's what we really wanted them to do in order to grow the application. And that was just occupying too small of a real estate on our main canvas page. So our original metrics, we were growing about 3% daily, which is okay, but not that great really. Um, we had four average invites per user. Uh, about 45% of users threw one or more ball when they came on the site. Um, and 20% bounce rate on that, on that page, people will jump off. Um, 3.25 page views per user, and then two minutes on average time on site. So then we changed it. We said, all right, you know, we looked at Kiss and we looked at some of the other applications and said, we need to simplify. So that's what we did. We just, when, whenever you get a request now, you come to this page where it says, you just got hit with a red dodgeball. So that links from the request into the Canvas page. Um, and then we have this call to action that says, hit 20 of your friends now to unlock other cool balls to throw. So we dangle that carrot of, you know, you can get other cool balls. And if that's something that motivates you, you're going to try to hit 20 of your friends. Um, the metrics we moved up to were about 18% daily user growth. On average, people were sending 11 invites per throw or per user. And 72% of the users that came to our page actually threw one or more. And that was the real big jump that we saw. Um, the growth didn't jump up as much as we wanted just because um, of the request response, but that was pretty good. Uh, so let me just talk about uh, some uh, engagement factors. So one, one day in class, uh, Yi actually picked on us, on our team, that we were not having as much engagement as some other apps were. So, uh, so we just took some really basic uh, web development sort of techniques. Uh, just really made a very clean uh, sort of uh, uh, index and uh, uh, laid out in a neat manner the kind of balls that users had uh, access to and shifted everything else to you know other pages uh, like rankings or events and uh, and it was uh, pretty clear that uh, that strategy actually worked uh, we so you noticed you know from 20 percent bounce rate we went down to nine percent e I'm trying to save my grade here. <laughs> And uh, 4.1 page views per user, and uh, and also increase the time a user spends on our site. So that's about it. Thanks. So uh, I guess uh, one thing we didn't really do was introduce the whole teaching team and uh, the course. I should have mentioned this before. The course started out with me and BJ being the uh, instructors, and Dan being our one TA. Uh, and then we got 100 people sign up for the course, and we're like, oh, shit. <laughs> so uh, we quickly started recruiting a few more people. We actually added two more TAs. Uh, so both uh, Rob Fan, who's been up right here, uh, who I met uh, at a Facebook meetup developer and also was taking the class. And then Greg uh, Schwartz also uh, was one of our TAs. Uh, and uh, Greg's been helping us with all the hosting on Amazon and Joyent. Um, but uh, I realized quickly we should also get some experts who have been doing this stuff. So my friend Yi used to work with me at PayPal, has been at Slide for a couple of years, actually is now an EIR at Venrock. And I knew he would built an app that I was actually playing all the time on Facebook that was very addictive. So I was like, hey, Yi, come on in. Um, and he'd actually done some instrumentation with Google Analytics. So a lot of the success that the class has actually had around the analytics and metrics success is due to Yi's work. Um, and uh, although he's not here right uh, tonight, Jia Shen, uh, is the CTO founder of RockU, was also uh, very helpful involved in the class, uh, as well as some other folks at, at various companies. So uh, one thing that was great that I didn't mention is that we, we really had a tremendous amount of support from people who are outside the academic environment who came in and spoke to the class, really got hands-on, and particularly uh, Yi's involvement uh, was just terrific. So with that, uh, go ahead, right, Yi. Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, as, as Dave mentioned, I, I was a, a product manager at, at, at PayPal for four and a half years and uh, at, at two years at, at Slide. And one of the things that, that I think you, you start to realize is there's, there's sort of a, a finite number of people in, in the Valley who really care a lot about uh, user engagement and instrumenting up web apps to, so that you can actually tell and figure out what's going on inside of applications. And I think we were really lucky uh, in the class to actually have a lot of those folks come out of the woodwork and volunteer their time and efforts uh, in the class. So um, the, the specific way that, that we operationalized uh, user engagement in our class uh, was really pretty easy. We, we used Google Analytics uh, and we looked at repeat visits 
uh, number of repeat visits in a, in a 30 day period for a particular application and time on site. Those are the key metrics that, that, that we looked at. Uh, and what I wanted to do is bring up a couple teams uh, to, to talk about their experiences with uh, driving those types of metrics. So first up, the photograph team. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Or? Yeah. Okay. Here we go. All right. So uh, our application is called. All right. Our application is called Photograph. Uh, it's a photo browsing application. Uh, I'm Adam Hahn. That's Mark Brennerman, and that's Abhishek Weiss. So, 4.1 billion. Uh, that's the number of photos that are out there in Facebook Photos. Um, and uh, I mean, Photos is definitely Facebook's killer app. Forty percent of all clicks on Facebook go through Photos. However. Facebook photos can range from anywhere from the extremely mundane, like this actual picture of a closet that someone posted in an album touring their new house, which does not bear any relevance to hardly anyone, <laughs> to the wonderfully artistic things that <laughs> Facebook <laughs> was totally meant for. <laughs> but if you'll see one of our team members in there. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> But what, what type of interface do you have to browse these 4.1 billion photos? You get a next button. You get a next button. It's extremely linear. And some of my friends have hundreds of photos, th a thousand. And if I want to see all photos of them, I have to click next a thousand times to make sure that I've seen all the greatest photos. Um, how do I make sure that the next photo isn't a closet, a dud? Uh, so we thought that we could introduce something sort of collaborative filtering. Yeah, we wanted to introduce sort of collaborative filtering to bring up the best photos and make them available and easy to access. So our first idea was to just put a, a rating system, similar to YouTube, on photos and just have a similar interface as Facebook photos. The problem with this is that YouTube has a thousand to one view to rating ratio. So we're not going to get many ratings on this stuff. So we tabled that idea for a while. So instead, we decided that we would have the engagement with the application. As the user works with the application, we want them to inherently give us some data so that we can build this collaborative filter. And so we came across Photograph. And here, instead of a next button, you have uh, three different pictures you can choose from. You have the same central photo and with the same information under it so that it feels like Facebook photos, but instead you're making an implicit choice by choosing one of these three photos, which you want to be the next. Also, you can uh, star a photo to share it on your profile and to sort of bookmark it to come back to it later. And we hope this application really makes uh, Facebook photos more engaging and people really able to find the great photos on Facebook and get rid of all the closets that no one really cares about. So, and this is our team. Thank you guys. All right, second application that we'd like to bring up is uh, by Johnny Huynh, and uh, it's called Love Child. How's it going, everybody? Good evening. So this is called Love Child. It's a digital parenting simulation for all of us, for all of us out there who thinks who think we know how to raise children. Well, now you have a chance to raise children with your friends. What's the old adage? It's they used to say it takes a village to raise a kid. We think it takes a social network to raise a love child. Um, we don't have any special collaborative filtering properties, but we do have collaborative parenting. And so what I want to do is I kind of want to walk through um, what you can do with Love Child now and what you'll be able to do with Love Child in the future. So essentially you're able to create a Love Child with your friends. And so let's name him Dave McClure. <laughs> Love girl. All right. Uh, we just recently added girls, um, and we. 
We also recently added um, different ethnicities, but right now, uh, let's try looking at the girl. You can invite multiple friends to parent with you. McClure. Um, let's see, DJ. Uh, you scroll down, click submit. So essentially you have a digital love child that you can raise with their friends. There are very simple actions that you can have with your love child. You can hug your love child, lecture love ch let your love child, or also discipline your love child, should your love child be bad. Um, we've got some terms of service complaints regarding the belt icon, so we're, <laughs> we're currently working on that modification uh, right now. Um, so to get to a more serious point, so in thinking about creating an engaging application, we want to create something that would get users, one, get their attention, two, would be humorous, three, would have them spend a lot of time on the site. Because we know that if they spend a lot of time on the site, they're more likely to click on ads, and eventually we all want to sell ads. Um, just kidding. Uh, so we, wanted, we came up uh, with an avatar-based system in which you had your love child. You weren't the child, though. You were the parent. And based on the actions you did to your child, like hugging your child or disciplining your child, it would change into a different type of child. So right now we have you know, a little ballerina girl, and depending on how much I discipline her, for example, maybe she, you know, her moods will go down or her confidence goes down. Right now it says, I can do anything I put my mind to it. Um, you know, we have an algorithm, I like that word, in which if you, uh, <laughs> in which if you lecture your child too much, their IQ goes down, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> So, but on a more serious note, uh, what, can, what are all the things that we plan on being able to do with Love Child? Right now it's still in beta, so if you go, and go ahead and try to add Love Child, please join our Facebook group. We're trying to get your input on what it is, what it takes to raise a child. Um, you know, we have a playground feature, an activities feature, in which your children can go and play with other people's love children um, through the poking uh, back and forth uh, feature on Facebook. Um, on the activities page, you can buy things for your ch children. You can try to buy its love with toys. You can make certain decisions that affect how it grows up. So, for example, uh, public school or private school. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Um, no, we, we do have that feature, actually. Um, it's all tied into a monetary basis. So depending on how much money you have, you can buy certain things for your kids, and you won't be able, be able to buy other things. Uh, one thing we're doing is using the Facebook mobile platform also to be able to have Love Child updates sent to your phone. Our vision for Love Child is to be the next Tamagotchi on social networks on your cell phone, and sort of um, go from that to selling uh, digital goods as well uh, using Love Child. So imagine buying real clothes sponsored by Nike for your Love Child. All right, that's my presentation. Thank you guys very much. I mean, we really got to give it to the, to the students. The, the creativity and just the expressiveness that they've come up with is just uh, amazing, amazing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, okay, there, there's, a, there's a couple themes that, that I think uh, some of you are, are going to start to see uh, bubble up from the, uh, from the class. So number one, lightweight social games do a really good job with driving user engagement. Um, and number two, uh, content sharing and discovery types of applications do a really good job with, uh, with driving user engagement. Um, just, just to give you some, some numbers, um, our average across the top uh, user engagement applications, uh, we're doing around eight visits in a 30-day period and five minutes of time on site for, a, uh, for each particular session. All right, next up, uh, we're going to have Greg uh, present Apps with a Purpose. So I'm introducing the uh, group doing the Kaplan application. And the Apps with a Purpose were sort of the opposite end of the spectrum from Dodgeball and Kiss Me and that stuff. Basically going for, rather than trying to get users to come back, trying to really let them accomplish something using the social network, using Facebook, you know, doing all kinds of things like that. So these guys actually did some experimentation with sponsorship, and they're going to tell you a little bit about their app. Hi, uh, my name is Raj. Uh, this is Brian, and this is Manish. And uh, the name of our app is College The Numbers. All right, so uh, recently there was an article on TechCrunch about the success of the applications uh, in our Stanford class. You know, even though the, the, the article was very interesting, what we found interesting were some of the comments that users left, uh, one of them being at the bottom here. Gotta love it when the Stanford intellectual elite are devoted to producing such monumental drivel. <laughs> 
And so we sort of took this as motivation uh, to sort of make something useful. So we said, you know, let's make something useful. Let's see if we can get uh, high schoolers into college. And so uh, that was our idea. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's very hard to do because what we were asking, yeah, <laughs> from our end, and I'll tell you why. So what we were asking to do was to get um, uh, high school students to input their GPA, their SAT, the schools that they're interested in applying to, um, and put them into the application so they could see exactly where they fall in the applicant pool. So that was the basic premise of our idea. But who wants to give you know, their scores to a bunch of students? And so we had credibility issues, um, obviously, and, and as well as distribution. We weren't sure how we were going to distribute this. So that's where uh, Kaplan comes into play. So what we, we thought is, you know, we were students once. We, we took SATs. I remember I would sit in front of that Kaplan book you know, for hours on end in order to bring my SAT scores up. And we, so this was the first name sort of that came into mind. So what we did was we, we quickly um, drafted up a quick email a long email, actually, uh, and then we followed up with a couple of phone calls, and then we had, um, we had the director of business development on the phone. And at this point, I'm sweating, by the way. Uh, and so uh, it, so it was my opportunity to give the pitch. So I t tell him, you know, what our idea is about, um, you know, what we're asking for. You know, we need credibility, and we need distribution, and we, so we need your help. And, and, and in return, you're going to get free development and a presence on Facebook. So in the end, you know, we were able to create an awesome app application, and the, the, the whole awesome thing was it was really easy to do. And so Manish now is going to talk more so about the application, the specifics of the application, but that's how we went about getting uh, Kaplan to jump on board. Hey, guys. I'm Manish Sethi. I'm the uh, lead developer for... Kaplan apps, a Kaplan College app, and so once we got the credibility and distribution of Kaplan, we actually went about and created the app. The one of the big issues is once you have a partner, you can't make a crappy app because they'll get mad at you. Um, so before we put their logo on the site, we had to show that we had a uh, usable app, and so this is the actual welcome page for what the app looks like when you first add it. Um, as you hit this page, you'll see a graph in the center, and um, at the bottom, you can enter in your you know your GPA and your SAT scores and your colleges that you want to apply to. Um, and your status at those colleges. Now the graph on the actual web page is interactive. So as you put your mouse above each of the, uh, the dots, they'll show you what that GPA and that SAT score is. That yellow dot right there, let me show you, let me zoom in on the graph. Uh, the yellow dot is your actual score and you can see that it's based in quadrants with the average GPA and SAT being the horizontal and vertical lines. Um, if you're in the top right quadrant, that means you got a pretty good shot of getting in. The gray dots are other people's scores. So you can actually see visually where you are in comparison to the school's reported data and where you are in comparison to other people using the application. Um, and lastly, we also wanted to make it more of a social venture. So you'll see here, this is your profile page on the app. Uh, you can look at all the colleges that you're applying to or you're interested in. But at the bottom, there's like a wall. Uh, it's very similar to the Facebook wall where, me where people can post uh, messages to one another. So our hope, is, um, and our hope is that eventually we'll have a lot of people posting wall messages when the actual college acceptances get in. Uh, get in. Because I've seen on a lot, there's a one other website that's similar to this. It's a, a lawyer law school app. Um, as people get into schools, other people will ask them questions about how they got in and things like that. Um, so we're going to take into account the social nature of this. Um, additionally, when you click on one of the schools, you can actually see all the other applicants in the app and their SAT scores and such um, as they're applying to the school. It's all anonymous, though, so people won't know exactly who you are. That's all. Next, we've got an app called The Giving Tree, and Sarah's coming up to talk about that. It uh, deals with Kiva and microfinancing, so. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'll quickly introduce my team, uh, who is not here. <laughs> we have Jamie, who worked on marketing for us, and Raghav, who did the analytics. Um, neither of them are here tonight, but Calvin is here. Um, he actually didn't take the class, but sort of served as an advisor and an idea man, sort of, for this project. Um, so basically, the application we developed was for Kiva, which, if you're not familiar, is a microfinance institution um, based out of San Francisco. And basically, our idea was that we would create an application on Facebook where users could see the profiles of businesses on Kiva, and we would actually use an external pool of money, um, and then Facebook users could pick which loans to distribute that money to. So this is the meat of my presentation. Um, this is the main page and the main functionality of our application. Um, so you can see at the top, we have loan sponsor information and um, 
right now it's actually Calvin's organization, Gumball Capital, who's funding us. And um, you can see how many loans we've fulfilled. Right now it's at about 41, which is at $25 each. So um, we're making some good progress there. And then you can see also we have all of the uh, loan information for about three businesses at a time, and it's being pulled off of Kiva's website. And so what users can do is come to this page and add a, a business to their profile. And when 25 users have added a business, we'll actually take $25 from our pool of money and push it through Kiva's website um, to the business that they supported. Um, so these are our numbers. I'm going to fly through these because, uh, for one, relative to everybody else, they're pretty, they're pretty bad. But um, <laughs> the, the idea is that we're actually starting to drive the user engagement here. Our numbers right now are about average. We have about 3.7 pages per visit and four minutes time on site. Um, but these numbers are going up every single day when we check back in on Google Analytics. And we've had sort of an ongoing marketing effort. Um, trying to get Kiva groups of varying size on Facebook to get their user base to come to us. And we're just starting to get traction there. So um, we actually have a lot of users starting to come in. We had a lot of learning points um, in the Facebook class. A lot of them are here. I think the, the biggest one and the most important was that our idea was really complex. Um, and if we had thought about it more at the beginning, we would have sort of second guessed how much of this we were going to implement for the course. Um, and that being said, the goal of the class, as was said at the beginning, I think, was that we were supposed to drive virality and user engagement. And the complexity of our ideas sort of made that get lost. But we're really proud of our work. And so um, we think it's pretty important regardless. Thank you. Next up, we've got Josh giving a presentation on rainforests. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Josh Reeves. I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, my other teammates could not join me, unfortunately, but uh, Sumit Medha is in India, and Fantia Fowler were the two primary developers. We uh, built a number of apps in the class, one of which has several hundred thousand users. But I'd like to actually focus this brief presentation on an app we launched about four days ago called Save the Rainforest, which lets you play a fun vocab game to actually save the rainforest. So I'll give you some quick uh, background on why we built the app and then show you how to use it. But the goal we had with the application um, was that we wanted to build something that was socially conscious. And we view the Facebook platform as a really interesting opportunity to get a lot of awareness for a specific cause. And so with the application, we wanted to leverage a lot of these inherent communication channels, a lot of the different mini feed, activity feed, social graph type features that we're all very familiar with to deliver a powerful message while also building a very engaging application. So what does the application look like? Um, I have the URL at the top of the page, so you guys can go check it out. But really quickly, it's a vocab game where you have to do synonym matching. You have one word, you have four different words you can select from. If you guys have seen the free rice application or website, it's very similar like that. We got inspired by that site. And for every six correct answers, you get to save one square foot of the rainforest. So we're basically taking the ad money from the page. We calculated the likelihood of a correct and an incorrect answer and we're donating to the Nature Conservancy's Adopt an Acre program to save the rainforest. So it's a pretty straightforward app. We obviously leverage Minifeed to tell your friends how much you're saving, let you invite your friends to go use the application. And to go through some quick data, like I said, it only launched about four days ago, but we've saved so far about 3,200 feet of the rainforest. We feel very proud about that. <laughs> Uh, we have about 800 people, uh, as of uh, yesterday, engaged in using the application. And we're seeing a ridiculously high engagement rate. So average session time is over eight minutes. And that's actually really surprising. Uh, we hope it stays up pretty high as the application grows. Uh, we feel there's a lot of potential for the application. And so some quick takeaways from using the app. Um, there's a lot of very passionate people that care about the rainforest. We had one person that saved over 200 square feet. That means that they have basically answered correctly over 1,200 questions, um, which is pretty fantastic. We want more users like that, so please refer them to our application. <laughs> and uh, users have a lot of uh, pride. A lot of the people commenting on the forum board, sharing it with their friends, actually have a real strong sense of ownership of using the application. So to us, it's a really cool idea of the Facebook platform kind of breaking outside the mold of 
really kind of fun entertainment oriented use scenarios and actually building meaning behind the applications that are being created. And there's a lot of ideas in that space. We feel there's a lot of potential in that space as well. So going forward on the virality side, we wanted to get some data on usage, some data on the monetization before we launch the next feature, which is for every friend you invite, you save some additional land. So we feel that will also contribute quite a bit towards the growth of the application. And we are also going to be um, improving the quality of the words. And so please, if there's any bloggers in the room, blog away. Uh, the app isn't inherently viral, so we feel that uh, word of mouth, blogging, press, it's a really great story about socially conscious applications on Facebook. We feel that would be a great way to grow the application. Thank you. Next up, we've got the tournament app. Hi, my name is Blake Cutler. My teammates are Matt Jones and Brent Pericello. And 10 weeks ago, we got together and asked ourselves how we can make um, a meaningful app. So we threw around some ideas, and we eventually settled on deciding how do you go back? We eventually decided on that we're going to make the creating the tournament experience better. So we decided that there's two problems of tournaments, and the first is that tournaments are really hard to create. So if you have handwritten that's anything like mine, it's really hard to draw the bracket, and it's hard to edit the bracket. You can't take people off, and you can't add people easily. The second problem is that it's difficult to share tournaments. So if you have to create an eight-person tournament, you have to invite 14 people and send 14 emails. To, invite a, to create a 16-person tournament, you have to send 30 invitations. And to create a 32-person tournament, you have to send 32, or six, sorry, 62 emails. This is not a position you would want to be in. <laughs> so what's the answer? How can, we, how can we solve this problem and make it easier for people to organize their tournaments online? Of course, the answer is Facebook. Um, if you do a quick search for tournaments in the generic uh, Facebook box, and you look at events that people have created that have the word tournaments in them, every week there's over 500 events that are created trying to cram tournaments into Facebook's event structure. And it just doesn't work. We want to help these people. So uh, <laughs> you can look at our landing page, and you can see it's really easy to create a tournament. One click, you can create it. Uh, you can administer tournaments that you've created and, and look at what's going on in, in tournaments in which you're a participant. All you got to do is fill out one, one little page and hit submit. Um, we let you send a link out so you can send it to your existing Facebook event or a Facebook group or your email list. You can also invite people directly and, of course, manage, manage the tournament, say who's won, put people on teams. And there's some lightweight, lightweight engagement. You can, go, you can go to the website and you can say, hey, you know, who's in this tournament? Let me see some pictures. You can write on a, a little trash talk wall. And, yeah. So what did we miss? Um, you know, our, our application's been around for, you know, six to eight weeks now. And, uh, we, you know, we only, we only have about 500 users, um, 30 daily active users. The, the things that we feel like we really, really missed so far have been uh, enough lightweight interactions. Um, you know, people get on Facebook, they want really simple things that they can do that are fun and engaging, like poking each other. Very fun. Um, <laughs> and so, so we need more things like that. Um, that what, what types of things can we do? Uh, you know, some ideas that we, we've had of like, you know, scheduling matches um, and, you know, challenging other people to like specific games. Um, you know, we, or, or now that we have our, uh, our product impl fully implemented, um, we could run a massive tournament, uh, like all the most epic battles you've ever imagined, like God versus Satan, uh, Santa versus the Easter Bunny. Uh, you know, tub girl versus, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, and now we realize that, you know, we've created this application, but we need to, we need to really specify it towards, a speci you know, gr groups um, that have those specific needs. So not everyone wants to use a generic tournaments application, but, uh, you know, people that play soccer want to run soccer tournaments and have specific so um, soccer statistics kept. Uh, you know, there, there are large markets out there for people to play basketball, uh, even college students, you know, playing beer pong, something as awful as that. Uh, so th thank you guys, and uh, we are tournaments. I was going to give a little presentation about some research I did on the psychology of Facebook and what makes Facebook itself, not the apps, but Facebook itself so compelling, so addictive, so much that 
students and many make it a ritual. It's like ritual computing. They do it morning, they do it night, and so on. But it, it feels a little less relevant to this thing about apps, and we'll be blogging or publishing stuff about that. Um, one of the things we challenged the students to do was think systematically about what they're doing. This wasn't a course in programming. It was a course in thinking, using metrics and psychology to um, revise and innovate. Um, each student developed a theoretical framework. Uh, Mike's going to share one of them now. I was having lunch today in San Francisco with uh, Hillary Clinton and Warren Buffett and a thousand other people. Um, when uh, Hillary asked uh, the Oracle of Omaha what he thought about Facebook, he said, I'd like to teach a course about it. Watch out, Dave and BJ. <laughs> and he wanted to ask the students just one question. What's Facebook worth? And if anyone answered, he'd fail them. At the risk of being failed, I want to tell you about six patterns for successfully creating a value on Facebook. Oops. It's not working properly. Can you get it on that? Can you get the we conducted a bottoms-up analysis of the top 100 apps on Appsaholic. Um, we found six patterns and we classified them. At the highest level, there's two kinds. There are native applications, which are tightly integrated into the profile pages and uh, rely on the friend selector and other uh, uh, features that are exposed by Facebook, and then those that don't. Um, within the native patterns, uh, there's, uh, p users can take actions or create artifacts that are either individually or uh, group directed. For example, in 1A, provoke and retaliate, you've seen a lot of those examples tonight, um, uh, friends can take an action on, uh, on their other friends. Uh, in contrast, in uh, 2B, group exchange apps, uh, uh, users can collectively create and share artifacts. Uh, this genre includes two of the top apps, Superwall and Funwall and some others like bump, Bumper Sticker. Within adapted, uh, uh, adapted patterns, uh, competition has games like Scrabble, Poker, video games that are adapted to the social context. Uh, these patterns are cross-cutting and many of the native apps uh, incorporate leaderboards and status levels to foster competition. And deception uh, involves uh, having fake Facebook buttons and other navigational tricks to earn revenue by getting people to install other, other applications. It's, it's quite common. Okay, so here's Bless You again as an example here. And it's quite simple because you just um, send your friends a blast by one click. So it works perfectly fit the provoke and retaliate pattern. But at the same time, it integrates a little of, uh, of all the other patterns at the same time. Yep. See? Um, it has a level system for computing. It has a top list for comparing. It has a um, profile box for self-expression and group exchange. It even has a deception link here that will lead user to our another application. So actually, I think this is quite common among Facebook applications that they usually focus on one pattern and a little bit of uh, other patterns like for um, better user engagement. And based on the main patterns they are focusing, um, which analyze the top 100 applications, and got several very interesting results here. So there are three things I want to highlight. Um, a, I guess it's more. A, a small number of uh, group exchange apps reached uh, a lot of users and are highly engaging. Within Reveal and Compare, it seems to be faddish has a large reach, uh, but low overall engagement as users drop off and go to the next one. And Compete is highly engaging, but it's a relatively uh, small niche audience. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about the presentations that you've just seen and that you'll, you'll see in the second half of tonight's uh, presentations and think about what patterns do they fit in and how do these patterns contribute to the success of these applications. So if you have any questions, I'm Mike Weeksner. This is Jing Jing Liu and, and BJ Fogg. We've got handouts if you're interested in, the, uh, in, 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 the, in studying the patterns. And uh, I'd love any feedback that you have about uh, what we're working on. Thanks. Thank you. <clears throat>
Okay, we saved the cluster of the most viral apps for last. Now, before we get there, first of all, can you see why wow was one of the most common words in my vocabulary the last 10 weeks? I mean, really impressive group of students, a lot of creativity. I learned a ton. I think that's one of my motivations for teaching is how much I learn. Um, number two, we want to give you a short, like, 15-second stand-up stretch break and sit back down so you don't get too restless because we've got some really interesting stuff coming up. We don't want you nodding off. So take 15, 30 seconds, and then we'll sit back down and get going. We We good? Okay, we're ready to go. Is the auto hooked up? No audio. We could maybe do this. Okay, let's let's get going. All right. So we have four teams that will. Should we just hold this to the mic? Okay, we we've got four teams that will present, and we have one point of view that will also present in the middle of the teams. And I think the first team has a video. Is that right? And so I'm going to need to put this mic by the speaker of the computer, folks in the sound room. So, um, okay, I'll just stand here and you guys take it away. Oh, Dave. Dave's introducing the, the crew. Sorry, Dave. Uh, I'll just be the mic holder. One of the interesting things about this class was how much the students helped each other. I had them do peer evaluations of teamwork and how others worked and over and over again I read oh that they, they pointed out people on other teams and how much they had helped each other that was one of our goals uh, that we had in the course was to develop a network of people that would collaborate for years to come and in some ways we achieved that in some ways we didn't we learned names only lately we could have we made some mistakes in teaching this class and we're trying to learn from those mistakes and one of them is we didn't make them learn each other's names the first few weeks and we made a bunch of other mistakes if you're interested uh, talk to me I'll tell you uh, but the students rose above our mistakes and did excellent work um, Dave's gonna introduce this segment so um, I just wanted to go briefly through, how do we flip the uh, monitor that's being shown up here? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so I, I think we're, we've saved some of the, you know, the most successful, on at least distribution terms, apps uh, at the end. I'm looking um, at the top six apps in the class, I think, in terms of the number of installs. There might be uh, a few others who are doing that. Um, so the total users numbers on the left is total number of installs. Uh, share the love looks like it'll probably crack the million user number relatively soon. Uh, the other five apps are all above a million users. Perfect Match is over three, and Send Hotness is over five. They're all also sort of close to the 100,000 user range. Um, and I think the most interesting story about this was that they, uh, at different times, all, each of those apps was sharing the lead in the class. Um, so we sort of started out, I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting this completely right, but Dodgeball was the initial breakout success. Kiss Me then eclipsed uh, Dodgeball. Send Hotness then eclipsed Kiss Me. Perfect Match, uh, I'm quoting the active user numbers, I guess, not the installs. Perfect Match was then over the top and then Hugs more recently. So uh, a lot of that was based on the class actually watching what, what, what the other teams were doing, learning new techniques, and then applying them. And each of the teams sort of building on each other's successes over time. Um, uh, I also think that these guys sort of uh, discovered what a lot of the other class was learning uh, more quickly and that they went immediately to simplistic uh, forms of initial communication. And we'll see that example over and over again. Um, lastly, uh, sorry, nope, no more lastly. Drive right in and uh, Kiss Me is up first.
Hello, my name is Eduardo Belluc. Here I'm with Chris Moco and uh, Joel Darnauer. We are the Kiss Me team. And we developed one of the first uh, really viral applications in the class. Okay, so here you can see here you can see our growth uh, represented by one of the most important metrics, which is the total number of installs. So basically, in a time window of six weeks, we have reached almost two million people, which is uh, quite impressive. And in order to understand some keys of our success, Chris will tell you how we got started. Um, you guys can all hear me. Sorry, I have to bend over. I'm a little, a little taller than my other group mates. Um, so... I was going to show a cute little video we made to uh, kind of uh, first get the word out about our application. The app had to do with uh, Full Moon on the Quad, which is a Stanford tradition where the seniors descend onto the quad and uh, initiate the freshmen, mostly girls, by uh, uh, giving them kisses. So um, that was kind of our initial idea. It's really popular on campus. We thought, we make this app, we help them set up their hookups at Full Moon on the Quad, and uh, we'll get, we'll get 6,000 users before uh, Full Moon. So it was like we had two weeks to get 6,000 users, and then our app would probably die. What we found right off the bat was that after a week, we were across 72 countries, and although we still had the Full Moon on the Quad tags everywhere, these people, we had, we had Turkey, Hong Kong, just totally in love with uh, Full Moon on the Quad. And we realized it wasn't Full Moon on the Quad that they were loving. It was the action of kissing. Um, and uh, so uh, kissing is incredible because it is so simple, but it carries so much weight. It has so many different meanings. You can send a kiss that's loving. You can have a caring one, friendly one and also a provocative one, which is another great part about it, because that's something that's really important in the, the Facebook world. Um, but is, key, is kissing really the only success to our app? We're, we're not really sure, so we've uh, investigated what else is really important that drives this application. Uh, an idea from 1964. <laughs> Thank you. Um, how many of you have heard the phrase, uh, the medium is the message? OK. I, you guys are HCI guys, so you probably should have. It was coined in 1964 by this guy, uh, Marshall McLuhan. And uh, basically, it underlines the power that mass media has to change culture. So I want to change this phrase a little bit and try to explain viral apps. OK? Um, the most important part of Kiss Me's interface is the way it makes you feel when you receive your first kiss. OK? And so the message is the medium means that this applications grow through their power to make us feel something when we first come into contact with them. Okay? It means that at their core, viral Facebook applications have to have some kind of positive message that makes us want to hear it over and over again. So there's a lot of people out there uh, who think that the future of Facebook is ads. And I kind of disagree with that. Um, our view is that if Google transformed what it means to know something, then Facebook has the potential to transform what it means to be someone. And so we're really grateful to the teaching team for getting us started. It's a really exciting place to be. So thanks, guys, and come talk to us after. I broke the rules. I took this off my belt. Is this mic working? Are we good? OK, I'll keep breaking the rules. So. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ed Baker, uh, and this is Joachim and Alex, and we are the Send Hotness team. Um, our app grew to 5 million users in five weeks, and uh, the basic idea is it lets you send hotness points to your friends. So, um, so our primary goal for this app was to reach as many users as possible in sh the shortest amount of time possible. Um, so we use this viral loop methodology to take a very metric-driven approach to figuring out how to get as many users as possible. Um, basically, the viral factor comes down to x times y times z, where x is the conversion rate, or the percentage of invited users who install the app, Y is the engagement rate. In our case, that's the percentage of users who actually send invites. And Z is the invitation rate, 
which is the average number of invites sent per invite per engaged user. Um, X and Y have upper bounds of 100%, and in reality, they're much below that. Z, on the other hand, doesn't really have an upper bound. Facebook imposes an upper bound of 20 invites per day. Um, but I'll let Joachim talk to you about uh, how we optimize Z. All right, so as Ed said, our goal in this application was really to maximize the number of invites sent per user, and that's how we were going to distribute it to uh, all of Facebook is our, our grand goal. Now, our approach, instead of making invites optional, was to actually require invites to unlock the full functionality of the application. Um, here's a distribution graph for the number of invites sent per user when we first launched the app. And so as, whereas a normal application might have a pretty smooth graph uh, kind of curving downwards, you in this application see a very strong peak at 10 users. And that's because the initial requir required number of invites was 10 users for users to actually use the whole application. Um, now, there's also a peak at zero because naturally a, a whole bunch of users don't actually want to fulfill this requirement. And then there's another peak at 20, and that's just uh, the number of Facebook users, or it's, that's the limit imposed by Facebook on the number of invites that can be sent per day. Um, so what we want to do here is really get as many invites as, as possible, so we want to shift these peaks over to the right. And so we did a lot of tweaking, but one of the main things that we did was actually increase the number of required invites. And you can see we increased it to 15, and that number just shoved right over to the right. And our growth just uh, kept growing um, and just uh, increased the, like, how fast it was growing. So Alex is going to talk a little bit more about um, the success of, uh, successes of our application. Uh, this last graph we have for you right here is grow it's charting our growth rate for the very first week. And I think the uh, success of this metric is pretty obvious from the graph. We also have statistics for the number of users we managed to accumulate per each week. The first week, we were in the 10,000s. The second week, we were in the 100,000s. By the third week, we had hit 1 million. And we've been growing fairly consistently since then. And after five weeks today, we have about 5 million installations. Uh, we, as you can imagine, we're pretty happy about this success. And while the growth rate isn't as astronomical as it was in this first week, it still is growing fairly consistently. And uh, when Dave introduced this section, he showed the, the adenomics chart. And I'm not sure if you noticed, but that did have a valuation number on it. And for anybody in this room who's interested, our application is for sale right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. OK, remember what I said about mass interpersonal persuasion? See how provocative that is? So it's still not working. Okay. Nicholas. Hi, everyone. So my application is called Perfect Match. And it's actually the motivation behind it was uh, pretty geeky. And I will tell you. So. Everyone has his own view about the other, about his likes. He, 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 so as we, as we can see here, all these three guys uh, like the, the same girl. And that yellow girl over there. And the girls have their own opinions. So, so there exists this uh, computer science uh, problem, which is called table marriage problem. <laughs> which uh, attempts to maximize the total happiness. <laughs> so it's an equilibrium where there are no two people who would both rather have each other than their current partners. And this is a solution for this problem. Uh, there exist many algorithms for this, and uh, many, of them, many of the variations of the problem are NP-complete and pretty difficult. Um, in fact, that's the correct way to solve the problem. <laughs> the slide speaks for itself. <laughs> so how, how, can we f how can you fix it? The people want to see number three. So give them number three first. <laughs> 
use whatever information you can get from Facebook, the social graph, their interests, and whatever else you can, you can, you can find to announce the best results you can get. Then, once you have them on your, on your site, collect the preferences of them by asking them to select which users they like most, to compare people and to click yes or no on different profiles. And after that, calculate the, 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 the better perfect match and announce the improved uh, results. So, uh, so this approach actually attracted 3.5 million users. Now they're 3.6 as we speak. And, uh, and these are some tricks behind it. Um, this is the mini feed of the user. As you can see, um, the, the bottom one is when the user uh, installed the application for 18 p.m. The top one is when the user actually found his perfect match. That was four minutes later. So, <laughs> <laughs> and of course we have uh, pictures so that it, it can attract more users to use the application. Another trick is to have a catchy message. We know your perfect match, do you? And the invitations. You, you want to encourage the users to invite other users uh, in this. Uh, so that, that's pretty much it. And what's next? Perfect video. You will see that coming. And you can actually even use it right now, but I wouldn't suggest uh, it because you won't be paying attention to the next uh, speakers. So. But try. <laughs> but uh, try it afterwards. It's still in very beta version. Just matches random users uh, together. The, the ones that are on, like, currently on, online are talking with each other, and when they click refresh, they're matched with another person and just speak for however much they want <laughs> on vi live video. Thank you. Hey, folks. Uh, my name is Dave Kozlo, and uh, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you a little story from Facebook land. Um, so, let's see here. It all started here. Uh, just last week, I decided I'd check out Superwall, which is a really popular app right now on Facebook. And so I installed the app and kind of, you know, jumping through some hoops, landed on this page here. Um, it says, draw graffiti for all your friends. So I think, all right, this is pretty interesting. I'll, I'll check it out and, you know, my, you know, just whip something up in a few minutes and uh, hit the post button and didn't think much of it. Um, but unbeknownst to me, um, <laughs> somewhere out in Facebook land, Danielle received a new Superwall post uh, from yours truly. And uh, that kind of brought a friend of mine, Danielle, into the picture here. And you're probably wondering, well, who's Danielle? I haven't actually seen Danielle in over four years. Um, High school was a long time ago, and uh, kind of an interesting chain of events ensued. So here's Danielle's super wall um, with my lovely graffiti on there, um, talking about penguins. It's absolutely absurd. Um, but in response to this message, Danielle said to me, oh, hey, thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the penguin. Are you coming home for New Year's? And so I post back. Um, on her wall, yeah, for sure. Are you going to be around? Uh, it's been like a bazillion years, bazillion being on the order of four or so. Um, <laughs> and then she replied to me saying, OK, we have a date. Wow. Um, that was pretty easy, huh? <laughs> so, so, yeah, <laughs> super wall, exactly, right? Um, so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So from an ostensibly absurd, um, silly action like throwing up a picture of a penguin on someone's wall, we have this actually really meaningful interaction here going on. Um, so yeah, what's, what's going on here? Um, you know, you hear all these numbers being thrown around, uh, millions of users, millions of dollars that these apps are worth. And um, kind of the, the skeptic in all of us might 
might might kind of think, well, you know, viral apps aren't really delivering any real value to the users. It, they're really just decorated invite pages. You know, you go to the app and boom, what do you, what's, what's the first thing you do? Oh, get more people involved and, you know, more and more users, but there, there really isn't any inherent value. But I don't believe that's the case at all. Um, just imagine for a moment what I would have had to do to kind of set up this date um, <laughs> manually. <laughs> um, am I going to call Danielle on the phone and be like, hey, so I kind of haven't seen you in like four years. Do you want to do chill over break? Is that cool? Um, <laughs> I, I don't really believe I would have met with nearly as much success. So <laughs> and uh, in, instead, this kind of whole interaction proceeded through Facebook. Um, and it was totally seamless, and it wasn't awkward at all. So um, I, just, I just kind of wanted to make this point here that these apps where um, kind of ostensibly the interactions are incredibly trivial, they actually serve as, they, they can serve as really nice springboards into really meaningful interactions with people. That's, that, that's what I got. So Rob and I and Brett here, uh, this doesn't work, Rob and I and Brett here, I kind of want to come at this from the TA perspective, at least Rob and I. Uh, this will be the final app presentation of the night. I know it's already, it's already 9 o'clock now. Um, hopefully nobody minds staying 10 or 15 minutes late. I think from a more general standpoint, Rob and I were sitting back for about four or five weeks watching the success of all these apps, helping out with every team, giving ideas, giving feedback, which is awesome. I mean, that's like, it's been so fulfilling for us. But as Stanford students, as entrepreneurs, it's been impossible for us to sit back without getting our hands dirty. So this application of Hugs was kind of our first experiment, just to say, can we take these insights that we've been distilling down from the class and apply them to an ap actual application and see success? And I think the point is that yes. So we teamed up with Brett here, who's also in the class, and uh, we have had a lot of success. Um, yeah, so basically Hugs was, is the app. Uh, it took us about two hours to put together. Uh, it was really simple to make. We just took a lot of the lessons that we learned from class and kind of doing what the rest of the class did, kind of uh, taking the things that were from other teams, uh, building on top of that, and kind of improving and iterating with it. And so we went ahead and did that. And before we knew it, we had, a, we had our own viral application. Basically, we, um, as of now, we have had hugs reaching every part of the world, uh, except for places that don't have internet access, actually how it goes. Um, but what, what's interesting to know here is the, the breakdown of the, the intensity of users. Um, UK is one, Canada two, and then US third. So the base of uh, new users, especially for applications, are coming from uh, the newest, uh, newest additions to Facebook. Yeah, quickly, this is just our growth graph here from Google Analytics. Like any of these other viral apps, you can see that it just, once it starts taking off, it really takes off. Um, Every day we're adding another 100,000 or 200,000 users. There have been 15 million hugs sent around the world. And yeah, maybe it's a little bit lame, uh, but 15 million hugs, virtual hugs, maybe we added a tiny little bit of goodness to the world. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe, maybe as a class together, maybe as a class, we added a tiny little bit of goodness to the world. Um, I think one of the big lessons we learned, and this goes back to the um, to Ed's presentation earlier, the viral factors. If you're looking for growth, make sure you measure the behaviors you care about. So, in our case, you know, similar to Kiss Me, similar to some of these other applications, what we cared most about was growth. So, what we wanted is to get people to send as many people to send as many invites as possible, and we did that in a number of ways. One thing we instituted recently, which was just this simple message that said, "Hug more people to unlock different types of hugs," and so again, we put something you know, behind that door so that they will send 15 invites out in order to just even see what's behind that door. Um, and this, this, you know, helped our growth story, basically. Um, and, you know, we also sometimes send a message that says, you know, you've, you've sent 74 hugs. On average, the user has sent 80 hugs, so send some more so you can kind of be up to par with the rest of, you know, your friends. And these, these types of things are very powerful in motivating user behavior. Uh, sure. So the other, thing, the other thing that we found is the little things really do make a difference. Um, who would have thought changing it from select the friends you want to hug to 
uh, choose the friends you want to hug makes a difference. But once we got to the user base that we had and the daily active users that we had, we could see the numbers of the metrics that we were recording drop dramatically as soon as we changed that word or as soon as we kind of did uh, change the way we have uh, our text in the yellow box. Um, all those little things make, actually make a significant difference in kind of the, the way people behave and the way people interpret what they have to do and how, what, what their next action should be. Uh, the last thing was build to scale. Not only should you build your code to kind of ramp up when, you're, when your target is to build a viral application, but you also so, should choose something that the topic itself can scale, meaning hugs is very general. And you saw some, some of the applications that did work were ones that were very simple, but if, if they wanted to build additional functionality on top of it, they easily could. So starting with hugs and you just send, some, send a hug to a couple people, you can easily build on top of that. So now you can have a, a community of people that, that hug and other things that kind of build on top of that. And just to the earlier point around, you know, whether these applications really have impact, just a couple notes. First of all is the, the little guys that we use up there is actually a, a, biz, a smaller business that creates these sort of hug, they're called like pocket hugs or something. And uh, we got in touch with them and talked with them and people based their posting on our forum board, you know, where do you find these hugs? I want to I buy one. Um, and, you know, so that's just, again, a, a, it's a distribution channel for a lot of businesses. Another thing that was really, I think, compelling for me is Seen on the forum board, one individual posted a message about sending their uh, hugs to their mom who has cancer just as sort of a support mechanism. And, you know, seeing that, before that I was like, well, we built this silly hugs application. You had 10 million hugs around the world. But it has a real impact. And I think you see that when you get to scale and you see the way people are using your application, you, it does really have an impact. So I just want to leave you with that message. To leave you with one final message also, I think this kind of comes back to the first thing I was saying, which is that you can learn this. And we did it in, inside of Facebook with Facebook kind of as a testing ground. But I think all these lessons apply to any website, any web application, whether it becomes a MySpace app, whether it becomes your own standalone website. And I really think that we've proven, and you know, Dave and BJ have taken upon themselves to prove that this can be learned. I mean, we have touched 15, 16 million human beings with this little side of the class right here in eight or 10 weeks. And it really has just been by iterating and learning as we go. So thanks to these guys so much for spearheading all this. Lou? Yeah, before uh, we wrap up for the evening, I just really want to encourage everybody to give a, a final round of applause to the students. They've really, really done an amazing job in this quarter. Can we get on the um So what I want to do just for the uh, last few minutes here of, uh, of the evening is just summarize uh, some of the key points that, that we've learned uh, as a class uh, by going through the last 10 weeks together. Um, so number one, there, there is this uh, sort of best practice that, that we've seen evolve out of each of the applications that have taken off, which is start by go, trying to go viral, uh, and then second, with that virally acquired audience, then go deep into user engagement. Um, the key to, to wrap around both of those topics is instrumentation. Uh, I, I think that, that theme was really driven through uh, the comments that, that you heard from the students. Everybody was really focused in on the numbers, and I think if you asked uh, each, of the, uh, each of the teams, I think they'd actually tell you that they spent much more time instrumenting each of the steps in the user actions that they were trying to achieve um, and looking at the numbers and looking at the analytics, they spent more, much more time doing that than actually developing a particular feature or changing a particular word on, on, on a page. That level of, of intense focus on instrumenting uh, applications and, and looking at the metrics in order to drive virality and in order to drive deep user engagement it was really one of, the, one of the key learnings out of the class. Uh, second topic uh, is speed, speed, speed. Um, so everything was, was really, really accelerated on the, uh, the, the social network uh, application development uh, cycle. So first of all, just the, the, the time scale for developing an application was hours and days. Uh, second, the, 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 the user feedback time. Uh, some of you saw the, uh, the, the, the viral loop that Ed talked about. We're talking about 11 hours to two days 
kind of total cycle time for, for going through that, that process. So really feedback, uh, really, really quick feedback uh, that, that application developers can get out of the uh, community of users. And then third, um, there's a really fast iteration time around learning from your competitors, learning from other people in the class, learning from other application developers that, that are on Facebook and copying what, what they're doing and in integrating and adapting the techniques that you see them working on into your own applications. And that's something that, that also took place on the scale of days and hours. So so th th that type of speed is just, I, I think, unheard of. Like anybody that's, that's familiar with website development or, or certainly desktop software development has just got to be blown away by, by that sort of order of magnitude reduction uh, in, in the cycle times for, for uh, developing these things. So we have a little bit of a, uh, uh, of a, of a cheeky analogy for this, but if you, if you think about uh, another area where uh, intense focus on instrumentation and then really fast interactions uh, takes place, uh, particle physics <laughs> is, actually comes to mind. And so this, uh, this cyclotron type of model of, of application development where you spend intense amounts of time setting up your rig, instrumenting your rig, trying to align everything just right, and then shoot uh, this high-speed stream of atoms through this thing and hopefully get more energy out of the thing than you put into it, that's really what's going on. And that cyclotron model of uh, application development is clearly winning on Facebook, and I think we could project that as each of the social networks uh, in line, MySpace, HiFi, Friendster, etc., as each of them also opens up uh, to, to the application developer network, you can predict that the cyclotron model of application development should be the winning model for, for each of those. Um, yeah, so I, I think with that, uh, we'll probably take some questions, and uh, yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Okay, I'm not sure I'm the expert to answer all your questions, but I'll field them, and I think we can do five minutes. Right here. Thanks. On some of the viral applications, there was, seemed to be a very quick and early transition from the uh, exponential to linear growth phase that seemed really early. Is, there any, is that true, and is there any reason for that? It's best position to answer that. Sorry, Rob? exponential first and then linear, or the other way around? Uh, exponential than linear, for example, with the, um, I think it was the hotness, it showed very fast growth, but by week three it was just adding a million and a half per week and not. Um, so only, while I come only to, a million and a half per week. Typically, um, in when, when you do have a viral app, it'll obviously will have the exponential growth, but um, at certain points you, you may hit a plateau, um, and I don't know if that's related to some different uh, some external factors such as scaling, which tend to be a, lot, a big, huge issue that all the teams hit really early on. Um, you hit so big and you can't scale up anymore. But a lot of it could also be there may be some uh, user app fatigue or the users might get um, a little more tired of the application itself. Uh, Ed can probably answer it better specifically. Yeah, I'll just chip in there because that is something that uh, happened with our app and I've seen it happen with others. Um, part of it was server issues, scalability issues, but the other thing is that viral factor does decline over time as you start to saturate the user base. So you've got to keep tuning it to keep that viral factor above one. And if you don't do that, it's going to eventually drop below one because it, what matters is the number of unique invites sent out to new people who don't already have the app. And as more and more people have the app, it's harder to reach people that don't yet have the app. Yeah, and I, I don't know, maybe Ed was just saying this, but you might have, once apps reach single digit million numbers, you're probably tapping out the potential audience to spread the app around. So you're actually a significant percentage of the overall Facebook audience, and you may not be able to tap more users to take those actions. So you, you may reach an effective limit with the number of people in the environment. I'm, I'm not sure if that was what was happening in there. Yeah. Let me give an answer that uh, I've heard from some of the teams. At <laughs> To monetize some of the apps, you have to reduce the quality of the user experience. And some of the team said, we're going to monetize. We didn't expect them to generate revenue, but um, I don't know if any of the teams did. want to comment on this. But sometimes you sacrifice quality of user experience, and they saw drops as they went to monetization, and they tried to find the optimal point between those two. So I, I think we're just cannibalizing some of your, your app to pull in money. So anyway. <laughs> yes? Uh -oh. So uh, I was going to take the class, ended up dropping it, so I really regret right now. And uh, <laughs> so I have two questions. So one is, um, have any of these apps that are made in your class been uh, sold? And if so, at what value, if you can disclose? <laughs> um, and two, the second question is, um, so is there more room for new apps? As in, suppose you were to offer another class, right, with another group of these students, 
do you think there's going to be a higher amount of uh, apps coming out, or do you think, you know, what do you think? Well, I'll answer the second one fast. There were, what, 6,000 apps before we even started the class. So, yeah, there's rooms for new apps. Yeah, maybe just to follow on that, I think I actually have two mics here, so I don't really need this one. <laughs> um, uh, so one of the things that I think we initially were concerned about with the class was, and I think there's this popular myth that like all the air has been already taken by Slide and Rock U, and that now after the, some of the invitation uh, limits were placed by Facebook uh, and dialed down, that it was harder to acquire it, and that's absolutely not the case. Um, I think that Rocky and Slide certainly have entrenched position and they have an advantage in that they can pour a bunch of existing base of users and new apps. So you might seek very fast competition for your ideas. Uh, but at the same time, we have multiple successes of apps reaching millions of users after, to after several dials down of, of Facebook kind of limiting the invitation process. And so I don't think that's the case at all. I think there's still plenty of room for adoption. Um, I, I think you should be expecting that people will fast follow and that there will be lots of competition for ideas that aren't terribly defensible. So none of the particular ideas in the class were initially very defensible. I think some of the students have learned some interesting things that they may not be revealing about some of their uh, techniques. Um, but we also, like I said, we got a lot of really great uh, help and advice uh, from folks in Slide and Rock U and from Facebook uh, and also from Google uh, on some of the instrumentation. Um, so we, we did have some unique advantages that maybe other people don't have, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I do think the biggest thing that people did wrong first was they overbuilt apps. Like the, by, by far, and, and that may not have been a mistake, they might have been intending to kind of go after a more user engagement focused goal or things, but if you really do want to tap the advantage of the Facebook platform, it's that distribution can be done very, very effectively, very, very quickly, and then you can build for user engagement or monetization. Yeah. And yeah, I just wanted to answer your, your specific question around uh, acquisitions of applications. Yeah. So yeah, we are aware of some uh, offers <laughs> that, that are in the, uh, in the works that I don't think we can really talk about them in a public forum. Um, but uh, I can say that the valuations um, that we're seeing tend to be in the eight cents per installed user range uh, for an untargeted demographic. And, and I would say, actually, some of the more successful apps in the class turned down offers and actually decided to incorporate, um, and, and it may be their primary pursuit, but I think they're seeing some interesting opportunities. Yes, sir. Uh, so there was an emphasis a lot, I don't know, maybe people can hear me without the mic. Uh, there was an emphasis a lot on instrumentation. Um, is there any place we can go to learn the best practices and how to go about? Um, I, I, mean, I know it's not a real science, right? It's not a defined thing, but you have to actually learn iteratively. But how do you start? So Yi's our in-house expert on that. And one of the reasons we're not teaching the class right away in the next semester is we're actually trying to take a month or two to summarize some of the results uh, and probably teach it in March or April. Um, and there's actually some limitations on what type of metrics can be collected, uh, both because the platform's new and because some information isn't accessible. And I, I would definitely take umbrage with the uh, assertion that uh, web analytics is not a real science. So. <laughs> 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 uh, but we could talk about that afterwards. <laughs> Um, so Here, hello. just a real quick follow on though. Um, so we used Google Analytics for a lot of the basic instrumentation, but I think as you mentioned, a lot of the teams built their own analytics to capture some information. Uh, also because Facebook profile pages and newsfeed impressions aren't available, you can't necessarily make analytical assessments about click-through rates to impression data because that's not, at least not currently available uh, from Facebook. Stay tuned for better tools. Hopefully, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, this is really interesting. Um, so. Given these uh, six patterns of success that you identified earlier, did you see some optimal interaction design patterns that emerged for each of those types of, um, you know, applications? Mike and Jing Jing, do you want to take that on? Do you have a uh, mic? Yep. I would say that um, in the six patterns you saw a lot of the best stuff of the, of the kinds of applications that we were able to be successful at. I'm currently turning the presentation into a longer report where I'll, I'll, I'll go into more, more detail about that. Each one is different, so I can't give a short answer right now. Oops, but were there sort of common patterns? Oh, well, simplicity, which is, I think that was, you know, something that people said, uh, you know, over, over and over again. For all of the native applications, there's, you know, the Facebook provides certain functions like the friend selector, which 
uh, you know, you have to put your branding in, in, and rebrand it and, and, and use that. And, and, and similarly, you have to have something nice on the profile page because um, that drives a lot of the, uh, the users. You've got to have a great name for your application because people see it in the application directory and they see it in the news feeds when people install it. And then separately, the um, non-native ones have a completely different sort of thing. You know, Scrabblicious, they had... Uh, uh, you know, they were they were tapping into things that people were familiar with offline. That were you know neat games that a certain segment of people are interested in, uh, classic video games and and things like that. So they're kind of like separate. But certainly for the ones that the kinds of things that most of our class was working on, it's using the the features that Facebook has effectively. One one of the lab projects we're working on is called Patterns of Persuasion. And with this kind of fast cycle and with this kind of ability to measure what's working, I think psychologists can <laughs> learn things about persuasion we never could learn before. So one last question. I had a question on distribution. Did any of the teams use any distribution techniques other than social tuning? I mean, did they use any ad networks or work with any of the other applications to cross-pollinate? Yeah, so actually, um, um, one of the things that we were trying to limit was not using paid distribution as an advantage for any of the teams in the class. I think there, there were uh, cases where they negotiated partnerships either with outside distribution partners or occasionally got help. Uh, at, le at least one or two of the class apps, I think, did get some help from either RockU or Slide. Um, but I'm sorry? Initial adoption, I mean, the experience varies. I think for, for a lot of the apps didn't have that initial distribution advantage and then maybe later did. But um, actually, the one thing that I think was most impactful was the class was actually uh, using an exchange banner uh, internally. So the, the class actually was promoting the class's apps. Uh, and then I think there's a couple of different variations on that as well. So there's, uh, I don't know, if we didn't show the Stanford Link Exchange uh, app. Uh, but there's a well, uh, there's an embed code that a lot of the students in the class use to to display their other apps from there. So the whole class got the benefit of some of the successful apps. So thank you so much. Thank you for coming by. Thank you.